Hello there and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. The last time we spoke, we went over a ton of different information about different parts of the brain and we talked about their functions. Today we're going to be continuing our conversation as we explore Unit 2, Topic 7, Tools for Examining Brain Structures and Functions. So in studying the brain, researchers will utilize case studies. In the past, case studies have been used to better understand brain damage, injuries to the brain, or different illnesses. Researchers also focus on the changes in individuals' mental processes, behaviors, their speech, and also function. One important case study is Phineas Gage. He was a railroad worker who was injured by an explosion where a tamping rod shot clean through his head. He shocked everyone by being able to walk partway back to the doctor and seemed to suffer no cognitive defects, at least at first. It was then discovered that he had a severe personality change. The place on his brain that was damaged was his prefrontal cortex and it had been discovered that the connection to his limbic system was severed as well. As we learned in the last video, this area is important for judgment and also emotional regulation. He no longer was the same person as before. Now one type of research that you'll want to have an understanding of is split brain research that was done by Roger Sperry and Michael Gazaniga. The split brain procedure has been done to help treat people with severe epilepsy. The procedure cuts the corpus callosum. This is what connects the left and right hemisphere of your brain. When the corpus callosum is cut, the right and left hemisphere can no longer communicate. By studying split brain patients, it was noticed that there was no impact on an individual's personality or intelligence. The split brain procedure allows researchers to better understand the different functions of each hemisphere. When trying to understand how the split brain procedure impacted patients, individuals were asked to look forward at a cross. Images would be flashed to the right of the cross and to the left of the cross. Images that were flashed to the right of the cross would be sent to the patient's left hemisphere, while images to the left of the cross would go to the patient's right hemisphere. What researcher found was that words that were shown to the patients on the right visual field, the patient would be able to say without any problem at all. But when words were shown to the left visual field, the patient would say they did not see anything. However, where things got really interesting was when researchers would give the individual a piece of paper and ask them to try and draw words from the left visual field with their left hand. What they discovered was that even though the individual could not say what they saw in the left visual field, they could draw it. Once they drew a picture of it, they could identify it because their right visual field would see the picture they drew. This is because the left hemisphere contains language. Remember Broca's area and Wernicke's area, they're located in the left hemisphere. So if I was to flash an image of a baby in the right visual field of a split brain patient and a picture of a crib in the left visual field of a split brain patient, they would be able to say the word baby but would not be able to see and verbalize the crib. But they would be able to draw the crib with their left hand. Split brain research shows us that no one is left brained or right brained. The left hemisphere is generally better at recognizing words, letters, interpreting language, processing language, and also logic. While the right hemisphere is better at spatial concepts, facial recognition, discerning directions, or distance. The left motor cortex controls movement on the right half of your body, while the right motor cortex controls movement on the left half of your body. Your left somatosensory cortex controls your perceptions of touch on the right side of your body, and the right somatosensory cortex controls it on the left side of your body. All of this is known as brain lateralization. This is differing functions of the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Think of the brain lateralization as divisions of labor between the two hemispheres. At the end of the day, all all of us use both hemispheres of our brain to accomplish different tasks. Now researchers and doctors observe the brain by utilizing different neuroimaging techniques. These tools help researchers and doctors understand different aspects of the human brain. The first tool is an EEG, which stands for an electroencephalogram. This is when electrodes are placed on an individual's scalp. This allows researchers to record electrical signals from neurons firing, which can be used for sleep and seizure research. Okay, quick break in the action. Try saying electroencephalogram five times fast. It's not as easy as it looks. Essentially, this is trying to measure an individual's brain waves. The purpose here is focusing on how the individual's brain is functioning. One advantage to this approach is it's non-invasive, and it can help identify abnormal electrical patterns, which may indicate a disorder. However, it can also be difficult to determine exactly which part of the brain area is causing the activity. The next tool is a CT, which is a series of advanced x-rays of the brain. This is used to locate brain damage or tumors in the brain. Unlike the EEG, which focuses on brain functions, this helps researchers focus on brain structure. A CT is very effective at examining a brain for abnormalities, but it does involve radiation and it won't be able to measure brain activity. Next tool is a PET scan, which stands for positron emission tomography. This involves injecting a small amount of radioactive glucose into an individual and then tracking the usage of that glucose in specific regions of the brain. This allows researchers and doctors to see which areas of the brain are active. This allows a better understanding of the function of the brain. The image can be shown in real time which areas of the brain are being active and firing. As a person's doing tasks, those areas 
areas of the brain will light up in red, and there'll be a varying scale of color until the least used areas are in blue. Now, it can be difficult to pinpoint the exact location of brain activity, and you do have to expose an individual to a low level of radioactive material. Another tool used to understand brain structures is an MRI, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. This provides a detailed picture of the brain by using a strong magnetic field to cause molecules to vibrate at different frequencies. An MRI takes many still pictures of slices of the brain and can turn those images into a movie. This modality does not involve radiation. However, due to the magnetic field, it cannot be used on patients who have metal implants. And individuals must remain still in a small confined area for an extended period of time. Lastly, there's fMRI, which stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, which helps researchers and doctors understand both the structures of the brain and function. fMRI uses MRI machines to produce images of the brain and then track those in real time. It allows researchers or doctors to measure blood flow carrying oxygen to active areas of the brain. It's kind of similar to PET scans because you're seeing the reds of the hotspot areas that are being used, but you are getting a much more detailed image because the MRI is showing exactly what part of the brain is active. Two other tools that are used to study the brain that I just want to quick touch on are lesion studies and autopsy. Researchers have used lesion studies to study specific areas of the brain by selecting specific areas in the brain and destroying brain tissue. The purpose is to study the brain function by destroying parts of the brain and then studying the brain's activity after the lesioning was done. This allows researchers to understand the different functions of each part of the brain. An autopsy is an examination of an individual's body who has died to discover the cause of death. Autopsies can be also conducted to better understand the extent of a disease. For example, brain autopsies can help us better understand hereditary diseases and that information can be used for research but also provide valuable information for an individual's next of kin. All of these different tools and methods for examining the brain allow us to understand the different structures and functions of the brain. Next time we'll be going into the adaptable brain with Unit 2 Topic 8. But before you watch any of those videos, it's time to answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section below. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, check out the Ultimate Review Packet, and the Mr. Sin Discord server. All of these will help you get an A in your class and also a 5 on that national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, I'll see you online.